build endurance. Build intensity. Build strength. Myofusion probiotic from Gaspari. Build yourself. Thanks for coming today, guys. Uh, my name is Joe Mullings uh, with Jiu-Jitsu Mania. I, uh, I'm going to present some information today on strength and conditioning specifically for combat sports. Uh, we're going to use an example today, one of the athletes who we just trained for UFC 142, uh, Edson Barboza. So we're going to take you through his camp, uh, his SNC and his camp, the curriculum we put him through, and how we design the curriculum and with what fundamentals in mind. Um, I'd like to first of all thank our sponsors, uh, Gaspari Nutrition, uh, Mass Suits, which is a, a great training suit we suggest you consider looking at, and House of Pain. Um, they've really evolved into a killer t-shirt company, so those guys support us. So if you have a chance, consider looking at their uh, gear and equipment. So as we look at the MMA world and we look at the BJJ world, we've spent over the last year soliciting and chatting with some of the top competitors, both uh, gi, no gi, as well as MMA. And every single competitor has agreed that the SNC, strength and conditioning, and the nutrition are going to be critical for elite players and success in the sport. And we've seen this replicated already in Major League Baseball, football, basketball, all the big leagues. Uh, gosh, linemen are faster than ever, running backs are stronger than ever, and each year it continues to get better. Some of it's better living through chemistry, some of it's through training techniques and programs, but the point is people are paying attention to the strength, conditioning, and nutrition in their training curriculum. BJJ and MMA, we're getting more elite athletes in that sport. In the past, we didn't attract nearly as many athletes that we get the caliber today. So we're working with better athletes today, stronger, faster, naturally. And now what we're trying to do is enhance that with strength and conditioning and nutrition. As you put together your program, obviously there are a number of things to pay attention to, right? There's skills training, there's strategy training, there's strength, there's nutrition, there's conditioning, there's mindset. So all of these make up the complete fighter, the, com the complete competitor. So you have to consider them all. We've watched over the years skills training ad nauseum. We all go to YouTube. We all go to the internet. We all buy Marcelo Garcia's tapes or whoever's tapes. And we spend a lot of time on skills training. But we aren't spending enough time until recently on the strength, conditioning, and nutrition side, which will allow you to execute those positions or the skills that you're going after. One of the things to remember, most competitive sports have a time limit to them. Nine innings, four quarters, whatever it is. And each of those quarters have a time limit. So the game rarely, no, unless it's rain, never ends before the event is over in a scheduled time. But if you think about combat sports, boxing, jiu-jitsu, MMA, it can at any time end. Why is that important? Because two or three seconds differential in having the strength or the energy to execute can end the fight with a submission or a strike. So keep that in mind. It's very, very important to keep that principle in mind because it will allow you to be faster, stronger, more sudden, and end the fight. What we're going to cover today is a view from 20,000 feet. So we will get into a little detail. I will get into a little science, very little science, but what I want this to be is more of a general principle understanding. First of all, as you train as an athlete or as a coach, you're never as good as you think you are and you're never as bad as you think you are. And through a training camp, you're going to only have one best day and you're only going to have one worst day. So it's critical to understand that as you take yourself through a camp or you coach somebody through a camp that most days are going to be average. Now it's where you set that average bar that's going to make a difference. The combat sports world expands, and while it expands, it's really shrinking. Because as it's getting bigger, 
we're able to access more competitors, more tournaments, more positions, more information. In the past, if you've been around jiu-jitsu for a long time, you've had certain styles or certain games come out of certain camps, whether it's a half guard or 50-50 or De La Hiva or whatever it is, half uh, Marcelo X guard. So they would be sprung upon competitors at times at tournaments. But now everybody sees what's going on. It's rare that you see a new game come out, if you will, that will be differentiating factors. Part of that is killing some of the jujitsu because now it's all about everybody knows each other's game and there's a lot of holding and stalling going on. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I think you're going to see a jump in jujitsu, especially because we've already seen it in MMA. The levels keep on jumping and no stalling because BJJ guys are going to start spending more time on becoming faster, more sudden, and, more, uh, and stronger. Because in the past, we used to have the argument, technique will outplay strength. Right? We've heard that when we, the first day we got on the mat. That's how it was sold to us. Well, why don't we have strength complement technique? Right? The argument used to be, oh, I don't have to work out with weights. I do jujitsu. Well, imagine if you worked out the right way and did jujitsu with perfect technique. And you're going to see more and more of that occur. Strength, conditioning, and nutrition, at least proper, will allow you to get to your move quicker. What does that mean? Everybody's got a move, everybody's got a position, everybody's got a tendency that they like. It might be a right hand if you're in Edson Barboza, it might be Marcelo Garcia taking your back. Whatever it is, being faster, stronger, and having more endurance will allow you to get to your favorite spot to end the fight. So we're going to look at a couple things relative to BJJ, MMA, and wrestling. First of all, muscles use fat proteins and carbs for energy. They're all energy systems dependent. And that's what we're going to cover today are energy systems. Intensity and duration will impact those. You're constantly transitioning between energy systems. And those energy systems, we'll go into a second, are your ATP, your anaerobic, and your aerobic systems. And then surfic, the lactic acid wave. We've all heard about people failing on the lactic acid side, right? You train, you train, you train, you train, you train, or you compete, you compete, and all of a sudden you just can't move anymore. We used the example recently of uh, uh, Carwin and uh, Lesnar. Carwin was on top of it, right? Pounded the hell out of him. Man, he gassed. He turned purple. Oxygen deprivation. He passed that lactic acid threshold, and he can, can, could not recover. And oftentimes in this sport, you can't recover. It takes entirely too long. Okay. Energy systems, building muscle, ATP, anaerobic, aerobic. We're going to talk about a program design with those. We're going to talk about how BJJ and MMA use certain musculature and how we impact those. And then finally, a suggested pr pr training program to dominate those. First of all, just an overview, your two energy systems. You've got an anaerobic and an aerobic. Within that anaerobic system, you're also going to have an ATP system. I just use this very simple graph of... On the left-hand side, you're going to see duration of maximal exercise. This means you're absolutely giving 100% effort. Anything in that one to three second time period is going to be an ATP anaerobic effort. As you slide down the scale here and you extend out quote-unquote maximal effort, you're going to see that there's a transition, an almost linear transition, between sliding from anaerobic ATP to aerobic. So if you think about an MMA round, you're sitting around here most of the time, or a jiu-jitsu match, you're sitting around here, right? The impact and how you design your training program has to consider these items. Let's just talk about some quick sports for one more reference. Again, simple. You look at the marathoner. He or she is using almost 98% aerobic energy system when they run a marathon. You swing back to a 400 meter dash. There, 40% of the time, they're in that ATP mode, which is that first five to 10 seconds, athlete dependent. Then after that, they slide over to that anaerobic mode. And then finally, there's always a little tossed in there on the aerobic side. So as you design your programs for BJJ or MMA, just understand what energy system you're addressing. All right, so let's look at ATP. Let's, let's just drill down on that. ATP, simply put, is your explosive energy. It's already existing at the cellular level in the muscle. It's sitting in there. 
When you blow it, it's gone. It does replenish itself, but during that 10, 15, 20 second time period, it's gone. The anaerobic system, which is your short term, it engages immediately after your ATP is blown. So if you've got 100% maximal effort going, you blow through that ATP in three to eight seconds, five to 10 seconds, again, athlete dependent, training dependent, you're gonna slide into that anaerobic system short term mode. This is typically where you'll hear about lactic acid crash occurring. And how you train for that threshold, we'll cut into in a second. Just digest this for a second. It's not nearly as complicated as it first looks. And we're going to take you through an 11-week camp as an example. I'm not suggesting that this is the camp that you should do, but it's a reference point that we used for Edson and UFC 142. It was an 11-week camp. So here you'll see your 11 weeks. We back it down to an event. On the left-hand side here, you're going to see maximal effort. We have a strength phase, which we'll drill into. We have a recovery week. We have an endurance phase. We have a conversion phase. We have one other recovery and regeneration week. And then we have the event. In each of these, we're going to talk about strength, anaerobic, anaerobic, and then finally the conversion to the event, whether it's a jiu-jitsu match, a jiu-jitsu event, or an MMA fight. The recovery and regeneration weeks are critical to the athlete. Not enough time is spent on that. I watch people go through 8, 10, 12 week programs and they're banging the heck out of their bodies. And especially if it's MMA, you've got boxing, wrestling, jiu-jitsu, strength and conditioning, and probably some aerobic work as well. You've got to give the body those weeks to rest and recover. And it doesn't mean you stop training, but what it does is you pull the string back on the duration of the train, but you keep the intensity high. And we'll go through some of that. Okay, so let's look at phase one, the strength phase. What we're trying to affect in the strength phase, and don't get too caught up in the picture, are two things we're going to talk about today. Myofibril and sarcoplasm. Those are the two parts of the muscle we're going to go after. When you work a muscle, you have generally two options. One is to make it much stronger, and one is to affect the endurance of it. When you're lifting heavy, you're actually in this myofibril phase. This is where you're thinking two to five reps, heavy lifts, lots of rest in between. And what you're doing is trying to put a very, very high strain from a weight perspective on the muscle. You're stimulating it to adapt to the load. So you're going in and you're affecting at this level through very heavy resistance on short reps, the myofibers. So if you think about Olympic lifters and strongmen, great strength, not so great endurance in relative terms. The sarcoplasmic. So the sarcoplasm, if we look back at this, just think of it as a reservoir of energy that this fiber sits in. Just generally think about that cable, that myofiber, which is a pure strength, sits in a reservoir that we call sarcoplasm. And the way that we increase the volume in there is very, very high repetitions in relative terms and the muscle under tension or stress for a duration. So one on the muscle building side is a heavy load, short reps. The other, the reservoir, which feeds the energy to the myofiber, is through increasing longer duration under stress. So let's look at this workout as an example. So for 142, we started out in his strength phase. This is where the rubber meets the road. The goals of the strength phase. We want to build a muscular base. We want to have tendon and ligament preparation. We want to have a neurological awakening of the athlete and his body for the heavy lifting. And we want to start to build athlete confidence. This phase on the strength side is one of those that the athlete almost within three or four weeks can immediately see a huge difference in his or her body relative to the heavy weight lifting. With every phase you go through, you need to have goals. All right? So before we get to those goals, what I like to do is I like heavy loads lifted safely by the fighter. 
I want him to be a weightlifter, uh, not a weightlifter or a power lifter, but what I want him to be is an athlete lifting weights. I stay away from Olympic lifts because they're open for injury, especially if the technique's not proper. I hear all kinds of people say, if you could only do a couple lifts, what would you do? 99.9% .9 of the people who do the Olympic lifts and are not professionals at it or train properly end up with injuries. You don't need that as a fighter, and you're not an Olympic weightlifter, right? You're a BJJ or an MMA guy. I want my athlete consuming large numbers of calories, four to 6,000 calories a week in this phase, depending on body weight. I want training three times a week, and I want him or her to be doing cardio five days a week on their own for 30 minutes. That's their homework. They do it without me. They get on a tread. They get out on the road. They get on a rower. They get in a pool. 30 minutes, steady cardio. I don't care where the heart rate is. Just get out there and do it. <clears throat> so the first phase, this is what we do. I happen to prefer hammer strength equipment. I'm a fan of it. In this phase, I make sure that they're on machines. Why am I on machines? Well, for the same reason free weights are fantastic for the fighter, they also at this phase limit the fighter because I can't go super heavy with him or her without the risk of injury. But I can load up a machine and have a very predictable path of the weight through the machine and make sure that my fighter is getting as, as, as much load on him with reducing the risk. So it's a trade-off. Shoulder presses, lat pulls, chest presses, there's a jammer machine which is basically a standing press machine, high rows, alternating leg presses on the, on the machine, and box step ups with dumbbells. That's what we'll work on for the first couple weeks. We'll hammer those. Very hard, two to four, three to five reps, a warm up set, five sets. Okay? That's where we're hitting a lot of his strength. Phase two, the endurance phase. My goals here, what I want to do is keep the skeletal musculature constantly under stress. Keep the weight on the athlete for a long time. The weight is constantly moving. Here, we're also trying to increase his lactic acid threshold. I wasn't as worried about that in phase one. Phase one, I was getting a foundation, building those muscles. Phase two is where I start to really affect the lactic acid threshold and the mitochondria development. Your mitochondria are really the smallest part that are your engines. They're your, they're, they're your fuel. They're your ovens for burning energy. So in phase two here, weight never stops moving. Think about that in your brain. Here's the program. The first week, it's a five round program. Rounds one, three, and five are resistance training. Rounds two and four are on a treadmill. What I'll do is I'll have him start with a dumbbell chest press. He'll hit it for 15 reps. He'll immediately run over to a bent over roll with a barbell, hit it for 20 reps. Standing squat machine, 20 reps. Some people call it a jump machine. Dumbbell high rows, 15 reps. Lateral raises up and outs, 15 reps. What are those? Those are here. Just up and out with a dumbbell. And then landmine rotations. Landmine rotation. You know what a landmine is? Landmines are the plate on the floor. It's got a swivel on it. You drop your 45 Olympic bar into it, and you rotate. You'll see on here, most of these are a push-pull, push-pull, push-pull alternate program. The athlete does not lock out at any time. He doesn't put down a set and breathe and grab his shorts. He hops off the bench. He hops off the machine. He sprints to his next machine. That, that there takes him about four to five minutes. I'll rotate him through that. So if he gets here to the landmine and I'm still at four minutes and I want him to go to five, I start him back up here again. See how it works? And he stays at the reps the whole time. So this is for a five minute period on Edson in particular and we continue to rotate through those programs. As Soon as he's done with that set, he's got one minute, he gets over to the treadmill. I set the treadmill at 7.5 miles an hour, 15 degree incline, and he gets on that and sprints for 30 seconds. He's allowed to step off it for 30 seconds after his 30, and then he gets it back on for 30 seconds. So it's a 30-30. That's what 30-30 means. 30 on, 30 off. And that will take him five minutes. You can do your math there. 30 on, 30 off, five reps. Okay, so that was round two. He gets back over to round three. He starts rotating through this again for a five-minute period. We just rotate through it. Wherever he stopped off on the last one, I pick him up on the next. 
and then we continue to slide through the program. What you'll see here change, the exercises will change, and the treadmill will go down to 30 20s. So he'll be on it working for 30, and then I'll be off at resting for 20, jump back on it for 30, off on 20. 15 degrees, seven and a half miles an hour. Week three, again, all this will be available on Jiu-Jitsu Mania for you to pull off, but push pulls, treads. And you'll see here the treads are kicked down to 30 15s. Those are brutal. Psychologically, those are the toughest on the fighter. The weightlifting and everything else, the boxing, the kickboxing, the wrestling, no problem. You will find every fighter will emotionally absolutely deplore the treadmills. Phase three, the conversion phase. This is, this is the payoff for the athlete. So this is where he starts to transition from the heavy endurance training now more towards thinking about getting faster and more sudden with his movements. And you'll see the conversion start to occur from strength to endurance. We've built the threshold up. Now we get to play. This is typically the, the part that the athlete is looking forward to because the payoff is there. Here what we want to do is we want to make sure we now to psychologically start preparing the athlete for the event. As a coach, this is the point where as you exercise with him or her, you'll be talking about movements in the fight. It's no longer lifting a sandbag or running or working on a bungee cord. You want to convert those to movements on the mat or in the cage. And that's how you're coaching the athlete through this. And this is where we want to be careful and manage the potential of overtraining or burnout with the athlete. So here we are in the phase three conversion phase. <clears throat> what you'll see here is this, what we put together is four rounds. So he'll stay in a five round match here. And what we'll do is we'll tread 30 by 20. He'll do that for three. He'll jump off. He'll do dumbbell push-ups, eight aside. Dumbbell push-ups, basically, you're laying on the ground. You're doing a push-up and you're pulling up. Down, pulling up with the dumbbell. Resistant band sprints, we'll put a big resistant band around him. He'll sprint down the, the mat or he'll sprint down the, the field, 30 yards by three, treads 30 by 20. That'll be a five minute round. He'll then jump into the second round. Jump squats, dumbbell cleans, 40 pound ball slams, landmine again. Battling ropes, you guys have all worked with the ropes. We enjoy working with those. Try those with jumping jacks, they're brutal. Box jumps, 90 pound sandbag squats, treads, barbell knees to feet press. That's starting out with your knees on the mat. You've got an Olympic barbell, you jump up to your feet, you'll pick up the bar, put it back down, then drop back down to your knees. Chins, and then a Schwinn Aerodyne. So that's where we take him on the conversion phase. The final recovery and regeneration, this period here, two weeks out from the fight, it's critical when you're managing the athlete. What we want to do here is keep the motor running. You've taken him through eight or ten weeks. He's all fired up. He's in the probably best shape he's going to be in, but he's also potentially liable to start to really slide into a bad overtraining phase. So what we're going to take here is we're going to keep the intensity up, but we're going to cut the duration of the training program by 50%. So if I was working him six rounds, five minutes a round, keeping his heart rate up 170 to 180, this recovery regen week, we're going to cut the rounds in half, but keep the intensity high. Okay, so intensity stays high, amount of work done is cut in half. All I'm doing is thinking about speed here. Speed, suddenness, reaction time, identification of counters, all of that. That's all we're thinking about here is converting everything to speed. Whether he's working with his coach on his boxing, whether he's working with his jiu-jitsu guy on a certain position, it's all about speed here. And speed means recognition of an opportunity. Okay? Weight management also will jump in here dramatically. So in here, depending on where your athlete is, at this week here, right here, again, using Edson as an example, he will be at about 168, 169 pounds in this conversion phase. 
our goal is three weeks out from the fight should be the weight that the athlete is fighting at. That doesn't mean what he weighs in at. It means what will he be fighting at when he steps into the cage or on the mat. So he's at 168 there. We take him to 155 for the fight. We bring him back up to 168 about 24 hours later. Okay, that's where I want him. That's where I want his body to be accustomed to. He worked all, all of his conversion phase in that weight. That's where we need to start to manage it in here. So when he hits here, we'll take him down to 161. If it's a week out from the fight, we want him right here about 160, 161. And then what we want him to do is cut four or five pounds as a 155er for fight day. I see too many guys starving themselves before two, three days out, and it's ridiculous. He's still consuming close to 1,500 to 2,200 calories the, other than the day before the fight, or the day before the weigh-in. I'll make it also technique and strategy heavy. Typically at that point, again, speed, technique, details, strategy. How are we going to win the fight? What are we going to do? What is he drilling into his head? And again, his body's healing that entire week. So food-wise, my partner Tom Dieters covers the nutritional side. You guys can catch that on jujitsumania.com. Tom just finished the last presentation for today. But this is all, all they're allowed to eat in their 11-week period. If it's not on that list, they're not allowed to eat it. We took the yodels off yesterday and the ding-dongs off yesterday. Okay? But if it's not on here, you cannot eat it. Those are the only things he's allowed to eat during his training program. And we've provided you also, this is sort of an easy grid that I strongly suggest anybody training to use. It's days of the week up top, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Here's your protein foods, here's your carb foods, here's your fat foods. When you eat one of the servings, you just check a box. On the next slide, this is how the box works. Feeding one, get two proteins in, get one veggie in, get one fat in, get one fruit in. Feeding three, one protein, one whole wheat pasta, one fat. So you see how it works? You just go in here. What can I get for my carb? I have to get one serving of ah, tomatoes, one serving of cauliflower. A serving is the size of your fist. We make it real simple. I don't need a scale. I don't need to worry about all that. When I say a serving of lean red meat, a piece the size of your fist. When I say a serving of cauliflower, size of your fist. When you make it simple, it makes compliance easier for the athlete. I want to mention the Gusperi uh, Peak Performance Stack. I had mentioned them. They're one of our sponsors. Uh, and I was interested uh, in their performance stack because what they have done is they've tried to address the key elements of the nutritional demands of a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or an MMA fighter, okay, with three product formulations. The first one is Anavite, which is their sport multivitamin formula. It also has beta alanine and carnitine in it. So again, that essential nutrient demand can be addressed. Uh, also, they have the Super Pump Max, which is their pre-workout formula with some of the branch chains and other components to support, again, what your body will be breaking down and accessing for an energy source during your workouts. And then lastly, Myofusion, which is your post-workout formula with high-quality, highly absorbable, bioavailable protein. So, again, check those formulas out. As you do your homework, you're going to be looking specifically for the nutrients that your body's going to need to support Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and MMA training. So give these some consideration. Okay, again, thanking our sponsors, Gaspari Nutrition, Mass Suits, and House of Pain.